So if you guess Louis XIV, you are correct. This is the Sun King. And I mean, frankly, he was just a megalomaniac. He actually went by during his lifetime, Louis the Great. And as you can see, I mean, he has great legs, that's for sure. He built great palaces. He spent great amounts of money. So one could say, yeah, he was super great. But the problems that he creates by his massive building and his accumulation of central centralized power in one person is going to create problems for his successor, Louis the Fifteenth. On a personal note, Louis the Fourteenth, you know, he had mistresses as well. Mistresses in France tended to be more powerful than the queens because it was thought in France they were very pragmatic. They knew their kings had to marry for political reasons or money. And so they allowed them to actually have mistresses who had an official place in court. And those mistresses they kept for love. So it was okay for a king to have a mistress that he loved. And so Louis did that. He kept, you know, one at a time. His grandson certainly won't follow in his footsteps, as we'll see next. This is Louis the 15th, and you're probably thinking his wife, but no, that's not his wife. This was Madame de Pompadour, his mistress. As I stated before, they tended to have more power in France. So Louis was known as Louis the Beloved, and he was king of France from 1715, when his grandfather, Louis the 14th, died, until his death in 1774. He spent the majority of that time really just lavishing money on his mistresses. And as he got older, he got worse. As we're going to see later, he's the one that begins the diamond necklace affair by actually commissioning this very expensive necklace for his very, very young girlfriend. Um, that really upset everybody because unlike, you know, this mistress of France, they were usually members of the aristocracy. But by the end of his life, Louis just kind of, you know, mingling with uh, the third estate, we'll put it this way. So his last mistress, uh, Madame du Barry, is going to be from the streets, actually. And that just upset everybody. Well, I mean, he was never, you know, mono monogamy was never his thing. He had a special house where he just had women after women after women. So not a very, you know... Uh, let's just say he didn't spend a lot of time on government and leave it at that. Louis became king of France in 1774, which meant he was king during the American Revolution. So, you know, really looking at Louis, you have to look at his character. I can tell you all his facts. You know, he's going to reign until 1792 and they cut his head off. All in between then, what we see is just weakness. Um, mostly previous views that he was unable to cope with the momentous events unfolding around him have recently been um, revised. While Louis had an excellent memory and took an interest, interest in a range of different intellectual pursuits, he tended to lack self-confidence and he appeared austere. Louis lacked the strength of character to combat the powerful factions in his court and failed at crucial times to give the necessary support to the reforming ministers. By 1788, he was forced to summon an estates general, and by 1792, he's dead. Um, and like I said, he's just weak, you know. It didn't help that he had an unpopular wife. It didn't help that she was a little bit more headstrong than he was. And so, you know, just all together, this was just a bad situation. And this is Queen Marie Antoinette. Marie Antoinette is complicated. As I've stated before, you know, anytime you're studying women in history, it's hard. She was the Archduchess of Austria, born to Maria Theresa, who was Empress of Austria. And her husband, Francis I, who had been Duke of Lorraine, which is right there near France. Um, she married uh, Louis in 1770 at the age of 14. But even, you have to understand, she came from a huge family. I mean, she had many, many sisters. 
and all of her sisters went in and made, you know, excellent marriages. They were the Queen of Spain, Portugal. They married into the House of Bourbon in Naples and to the House of Parma in Italy. I mean, they were all over and all of them, you know, made these really good marriages. And here she was, she became the Queen of France. The only problem was is that Austria and France had been fighting a series of wars throughout the 17 hundreds and so the French people didn't much care for the Austrians and they certainly didn't like her and I mean she had been raised in privilege she didn't know any different and she came to France and in France again absolute monarchs were treated with privilege as well and I mean in fact her probably her childhood was more austere than certainly Louis was where Louis never had to ever learn how to do anything by themselves their marriage is going to have problems. And now Louis had a little problem that required surgery before he could actually um, have children. And it won't be till later that he has that. But this is the 1700s. And frankly, if a queen didn't have children, it was her fault. Didn't matter if the guy was sterile. Didn't matter. Like we're going to see the king of Spain, for instance, was so inbred he was sterile. Didn't matter. It was always the woman's fault. And so she will suffer for the, you know, for a long time. And so it's hard when all of the sources are negative. It's really hard to have a good, you know, basis of who she was. Was she spoiled? Yeah. Was she privileged? Yeah. Did that contribute to the revolution? Absolutely. Oh, the diamond necklace affair. This is a confidence game. This is a trickster con that's going to be played on Marie Antoinette. And what it ends up doing is being one of the really leading factors of the sh at least the long-term almost short-term causes of the French Revolution because all of this takes place in in 1785 which is you know right before the country falls into super bad economic times so let me tell you about this story this was actually commissioned by Louis the 15th before he died in 1772 and so it was supposed to be a special gift estimated cost at the time i mean i don't even want to tell you the time estimated cost today is 15.1 million dollars so it would take the jeweler so many years and a great deal of money to just amass the appropriate set of diamonds and by then by the time they're almost done louis the 15th dies and we're not sure why probably of syphilis i mean that's oh smallpox he dies of smallpox um, but anyways, his grandson inherits, and so the jewelers, well, the first thing the grandson does is get rid of the mistress, Madame du Barry, and bans her. And so the jewelers hope that maybe Louis will buy it for Marie Antoinette, but Marie Antoinette sees it and is like, no. And in fact, she was quoted as saying at the time, you know, that money would be better spent on 70 ships for France. So she said, no, absolutely not. So how does this get blamed on her? Well, there was a cardinal, Cardinal Rouhan who, you know, kind of lost favor over time, and he really wanted to gain favor again. And then there was a trickster, a woman. I can't remember her name. So we'll call her Madame. But anyway, she wants to raise her status at court. So what she does is she, the jewelers contact her and kind of see her as a go-between. She lies to them. She's like, oh, yes, I'm friends with the queen. I could get her to buy this necklace. That's my imitation of her. But she wasn't friends with the queen. And so the jewelers think that this can do. And then, you know, this can happen. Well, then she becomes the mistress of the cardinal. And the cardinal wants to, you know, get his reputation back. So he begins to negotiate the price, thinking, you know, she cons him actually into buying it, saying that also Marie Antoinette wants it. So it's just a big, big affair. And in the end, Marie Antoinette didn't want it. The jewelers, this cardinal ends up paying for the necklace and then goes broke thinking that the queen is going to buy it from him, he ends up losing favor. Madame, who did the whole con to begin with, ends up in jail and then later immigrates to London. And then Marie Antoinette gets blamed for the whole thing. And in reality, she said no in the beginning. So that's the diamond necklace affair. So this is Emmanuel C.S. And actually, he's going to be one of the earliest proponents of the French Revolution. He's from a bourgeoisie family, highly educated, becomes a priest. So he's a member of the second estate to begin with. But later, he's going to join the third estate and represent them during the estates general. He's influential. He wrote the pamphlet 
um, very famous pamphlet, What is the Third Estate, where he argues that they're the most important estate in the nation and should be represented. He's going to make it through the reign of terror. And later when asked, you know, how did you make it through the reign of terror? He just simply said, I survived. He's even going to then further um, help Napoleon rise to power as well. So he's one of the great influential political thinkers of his time. And wow, what a survival instinct he had, huh? So this is Count of Maribu. And what a scandalous guy this was, um, or he was. Look, even before the French Revolution, he's kind of old when the French Revolution starts anyways. So he lived like a very wild, free kind of lifestyle. His two main problems seem to be women and gambling. I mean, going all the way back to the first of it. Now, here's the surprising thing. You always see any picture of uh, Count Marabou with his face kind of pointing away. It's because when he was five, he got smallpox and he was disfigured very severely. So, you know, that and the fact that he was very close to his mother accounted for the fact that his father didn't like him. So his father sent him to boarding school at like the age of five where he learned, you know, military matters. So that's what always saved the Count of Marabou is that he was brilliant, fearless warrior. But when it came to women, he was terrible. I mean, this is how he gets his wife, by the way. So he's in debt because of gambling, and there's this rich heiress, and he really, really wants to meet her. But French society is very strict, and heiresses, you know, they just didn't pick their own spouses. That was arranged by their father. So he actually bribes one of this uh, lady's maids to let him in, and he goes in, never sees her, but then he pretends like they had a romance, like they had an encounter that night. Which, you know, if that got out, it would ruin her reputation. And it kind of forced uh, her father to arrange a marriage. But in the end, actually, she ends up divorcing him in a very famous case. So that was a complete scandal. And then he went on to write these letters to one of his mistresses that are just really, really racy. I mean, even for today, they're racy. And so those were published and, and you know, gosh, that just went out. Now, by the time of the revolution, again, he's a charming rogue is what we would call him. He was old, um, but he was a warrior and he's a really good writer. And that is what is going to keep him through the revolution. And really, frankly, luckily, he just dies of natural causes in, you know, a couple of years, like, I think 1791. Afterwards... It was revealed that Marabou had been in the secret service of King Louis the Sixteenth. Um, this shattered his reputation in France, and his corpse is going to actually end up being removed from the Pantheon, placed in a lead coffin, and then just given given a communal burial. Um, in the end, you know, this guy would have, like I said, his main problems were women and gambling, and both were expensive in France at the time. So here he is, the Marquis de Lafayette. And you know what? After fighting in the United States um, American Revolution, Lafayette got involved in the French Revolution. He was leader of the National Guard in those early days, and he really kind of attempted to maintain order and keep a middle ground. But you know what I tell you? Nobody likes a moderate. Um, and even as um, radicals gained influence, Finally, though, you know, that middle, like I said, moderate, Lafayette was finally accused of being a traitor when the king and his family almost escaped in 1791. The following year, he had to flee from France as radicals ordered his arrest. He was captured by Austria, and then, oh my gosh, he spends like five years in prison. Lafayette returns to France after Napoleon secured his release, but, you know, Things just, you know, really didn't do well for him after that period. And it's kind of sad for Lafayette. And that's it. Jean-Paul Marat. He was an incredibly complicated man, and perhaps the most influential journalist during the French Revolution. His journalism was known for its fierce tone and uncompromising stance towards the new leaders and institutions of the revolution. So he rose up 
during that early period of moderation. And he was a radical. Among other things, he advocated for basic human rights for the poorest people in France. He was a provocative journalist and he is credited with playing a significant role in several radical events of the revolution. One of those things that he probably holds responsibility for is called the September Massacres. This breaks out between September 2nd and 6th in 1792, and it kind of starts the reign of terror. It doesn't, you know, this is when it's the most, it's the most violent. Um, it begins with this fear, this rumor starts and some historians blame Marat, some will blame another guy we're going to see down the line in a little bit. But anyways, there's this rumor that the royalists are coming to overthrow the new Republican government. And that starts a series of killings, actually, that are going to occur by the state. Um, between Historians debate the numbers, but probably between 1,100 to 1,600 people were murdered in that short period of time. Just in the first 20 hours alone, 1,000 people were murdered. So they were sent to the guillotine, and this was attributed to him. But understand that this was mass hysteria, and the collective mentality at the time made it possible. You know, it wasn't that people were like, no, no, don't kill all these people. Mostly they were showing up and cheering, kill, kill, kill. So, you know, you have to remember the time period. Um, Marat will go on to really have his heyday during this one radical year, the Reign of Terror, and then um, he's murdered in 1793. He was assassinated by a woman, and we'll see her next. Um, I didn't mean to make it sound like I was very proud of her for assassinating Marat. Like I said, he's complicated. He he believed that only radical change could, you know, increase the the livelihood of the poor, and that's a noble thing. The method, though, hmm, not so sure. So this is Charlotte Corday, and she's our assassin. She was actually a Girardin sympathizer, and they were the moderates of the revolution that reigned right before the Jacobins take over in 1792 and institute the Reign of Terror. So she was a moderate revolutionary. Now she was raised in an affluent life in the countryside and honestly she was way too educated and way too bored. Um, as the revolution breaks out she begins to visit different um, relatives where she meets young men that are full of fire for the revolution and it makes her full of fire. But in the end she's going to see that Marat had taken it too far. It's by this time it's 1793, the Reign of Terror, you know, September massacres had already happened. The Reign of Terror had killed probably 50,000 people and she blamed Marat for that. She was somebody looking around maybe at her society and thinking, everybody's gone mad, what do I do? She probably should have just written a pamphlet. Instead, she shows up at Marat's house one day pretending to be, you know, a revolutionary radical like him. And she stabs him while he's in his bathtub. And that makes him dead. And four days later, she's going to be guillotined. So that's kind of the story about Charlotte Corday. This is Jacques Rousseau. He was a member of the National Convention, that early phase after they got rid of the king. It lasted from September 1792 to 1793, and it was really dominated by a struggle between radicals and moderates. Brousseau represented the moderates. They were the Girondins, and they were more moderate. They attracted businessmen, merchants, industrialists, and financiers. And so he was put up against these more, this more radical element that in the end is going to win and really ultimately start the reign of terror. As a result, you know, he's going to be an influential member in those early years, of course. He was on a diplomatic committee, and his report led France to declaring war on Great Britain and the Dutch right during the revolution. However, as the radicals gained power, Brissot was accused of being friends with a traitor and of bringing war upon France, and he was ultimately guillotined on October 31st, 1793. So yet again, one of those early moderates killed off during the Reign of Terror. 
Okay, so here is Maximilian Robespierre. And what we're going to find with him is a casualty, really, of this time period. Okay, so we're going to see it with Napoleon. We've already seen it with Marat. We're going to see it with a man named Deton, and certainly Robespierre, and definitely Napoleon. And that is, perhaps they were good men. It's hard to tell because all of the history of the 1800s was generally written by the British, and the British did not like any of these men. So Robespierre is probably one of the best known and most influential leaders of the French Revolution. Among other things, he was an outspoken advocate for the poor, for universal male suffrage, I might add. Um, he also was one of the biggest proponents for the abolition of slavery in the French colonies. And I will tell you, slavery in the French colonies was the harshest form of slavery in the New World. His steadfast, you know, beliefs had earned him the nickname the Incorruptible. Following the defeat of the Girondins, he's going to take over and he's going to form with the Radicals the Committee of Public Safety, which became the de facto executive government in France during the phase known as the Reign of Terror. Robespierre was the leading member of this committee in the name of ridding the nation of the enemies of the revolution, an estimated 40 to 50,000 people were executed during the reign of terror. However, by mid-1794, Robespierre became a target of conspiracies. Basically, he started targeting his friends. So he started being like, oh, this person's an enemy. And he kind of, you know, this was like McCarthyism, but in France during the French Revolution. He got too big, he got too egotistical, and he started attacking his own party members, and they got really scared, so they tricked him into coming into a meeting, ordered his arrest. They actually shot him, and his jaw was hanging off, and he jumped out a window, and then survives the jump out the window as well. They arrest him and take him to the guillotine, and really, his death on July 28th of 1794 ends the reign of terror. This is Louis de Saint-Just. He was the youngest of the deputies elected to the National Convention in 1792. He gave a fiery speech when he got there condemning Louis XVI. He demanded that Louis Capet should be judged not as a king or even a citizen, but as a traitor, an enemy who deserves death. After spearhe spearheading the movement, that led to the execution, St. Just drafted the radical French constitution of 1793. During the reign of terror, he became a close ally of Robespierre. He was dubbed the angel of death as he became the face of terror with his organization of arrests and prosecutions of many well-known figures of the revolution. He was also sent as a figure of authority to the French army during its rocky start in the French Revolutionary Wars. He is said to have helped in the revival of the army through his implementation of strict discipline. Unfortunately, again, his, like his good buddy Robespierre, he went too far, and like Robespierre, he's going to be executed by guillotine on July 28, 1794, again ending the reign of terror. George Deton. So George Deton was a leader of the Cordelier Club, one of the popular clubs of the French Revolution. So he, he was running this club, and it was a moderate club at the beginning, you know. So he's a part of those early days. He's got this fiery way of speaking, and, and people just loved him. But he became kind of significantly more radical and then left radicalism. So he's very, very confusing. But anyways, under his leadership, this club becomes like a political force. He's going to make frequent speeches to just different crowds. And by August 10, 1792, one of his speeches kind of sends his angry crowd to march on the Tuileries Palace. And that is where the king had been residing since he had fled Versailles, or not fled, actually, was forced to leave Versailles. So he's in this palace, and an angry crowd shows up. They actually kill the guards, the Swiss guards that are protecting him. As a result, the king had to flee to the National Assembly. By the way, now it's a National Assembly. It gets really confusing in the French Revolution. We'll talk about that later. But anyways, this becomes a key event 
in the role of overthrowing the king and ultimately his execution. And Dayton said, you know, at the time, some historians actually, they argue, but they said, you know, he's the chief force in the overthrow of the French monarchy. His role, though, we don't know. We're not sure. Um, but he did take credit for it. So we know that he's a part of the reign of terror in those early days. You know, he's a radical and he becomes the first president of the Committee of Public Safety, which is going to kill so many people. But um, as it began, he became more modern. He's kind of like, hey, guys, you know, maybe we should stop at killing, you know, 15,000 people or 20,000 people. Maybe we've had our day. Ultimately, as a result of becoming moderate, this leads to his death by guillotine on April 5th, 1794. So this is Lazare Carnot, and as you can see, very depressing guy. Look at that painting. Anyways, after the execution of King Louis XVI in January 1793, France's enemies wanted to destroy the republic and reinstate a monarchy. Several European powers, um, led by Great Britain, thus formed a coalition to defeat France. And it seemed that the fall of the republic was imminent. At this time, Carnot, a mathematician and a physicist, was promoted to the Committee of Public Safety, displaying an excellent talent for organization and for enforcing discipline. Carnot set about rearranging the disordered French Revolutionary Army. He also introduced compulsory enlistment to raise arm to raise you know, more men for France's army. The French Revolutionary Army successfully expelled the foreign forces from French soil. This kind of solidified the revolution because. First of all, they had the revolution, then they fought to protect the revolution. So very, very important. Carnot is thus known as the organizer of the victory in the French Revolutionary Wars. He was also appointed later by Napoleon Bonaparte as general in chief of the Army of Italy when no one else backed him. By 1800s, um, after the Revolutionary War, he becomes Minister of War under Napoleon. So again, we have this man that's just an exceptional military talent. And that's how he keeps his head during the revolutionary period. Ah, Napoleon Bonaparte. We will talk about him much later in depth. Right now, I just want to talk about what he was like during the revolution. So the French Revolution was really widespread and violent by 1793. Um, as we can see, you know, we're going to enter a period of the re reign of terror. Some citizens had begun supporting a royalist faction. Others had taken up arms against the revolutionary forces. France was at civil war. And it was also engaged with war with other countries like Great Britain, who wanted to restore the monarchy. At such a time, Napoleon rose to prominence as a general of the revolutionary government against the royalist forces. After crushing an internal revolt by the royalist forces, he was given command of the Army of Italy. He then led several successful campaigns against the coalition of European countries, virtually winning every battle. He became a national hero in France due to his exceptional military talent. He took advantage of this to organize a coup. Um, and this is what he did, you know, he, he overthrew the Directory, which had been ruling France after the Reign of Terror stopped, and he became the first Council of the Republic. This is considered the end of the French Revolution. Napoleon went on to become Emperor of the French in 1804, and he made France the leading European power for a while. Now, he gets a bad rap in history because the British hate him. They hate him. He challenged them overseas, in colonies, on the continent, in their own country, and they hate him. And so he generally gets a bad rap, but what Napoleon did for Europe is something we're going to discuss in depth when we actually have an entire unit called the Napoleonic Era. Ah, uh, Empress Josephine. Her marriage to Napoleon was her second, and actually she was older than Napoleon which might explain why they never had children. She was, you know, before, between her first and second marriages, she was a mistress to very, very um, high priced men. And you know what? She really kind of did what she had to do. Her first husband was an aristocrat and he was guillotined during the reign of terror. And she was actually imprisoned during that period too, until really five days after his execution, she's released because she was beautiful and, you know, she did what she had to do. And frankly, I'm not going to judge her for that. 
she survives the reign of terror as a result. She had two children, um, and they're going to become very significant to royal lineage throughout Europe because Napoleon will adopt these children. Through her daughter, Hortense, she was the maternal grandmother of Napoleon III, who will be the next, the ruler of France, you know, from seven, uh, 18, what, 50 to 1872. <clears throat> and through her son, Eugene, she was a great grandmother of the Swedish and Danish kings and queens. The reigning houses of Belgium, Norway, and Luxembourg also are descended from her. But she couldn't bear Napoleon any children, and so he divorced her in 1810 to marry Marie Louise of Austria. They remained close, though. They exchanged letters throughout the time period, and, and she's going to die before, really, before he does, and many years before he does. But anyways, they did remain close. So this is Marie Louise of Austria, and she was a Habsburg. Again, we'll talk about the Habsburgs more later, but she was the eldest child of the Habsburg Emperor Francis II of Austria and his second wife, Maria Theresa of Naples in Sicily. Marie Louise grew up during a period of contentious conflict between Austria and revolutionary France. Um, there had been a series of military defeats at the hands of Napoleon Bonaparte, so the Austrians really, really hated him. Um, and, you know, this created a heavy human toll on Austria and led Francis to dissolve the Holy Roman Empire. By the end of the war of the Fifth Coalition is going to result in the marriage of Napoleon and Marie Louise in 1810. This ushered in a brief period of peace and friendship between Austria and the French Empire. Marie Louise agreed to marriage, uh, to this marriage. She actually agreed to it, despite being raised to despise France. She was adored by Napoleon. He had been eager to marry a member of one of Europe's leading royal houses to cement his relatively young empire. And, you know, they all turned him down, actually. And so she actually makes the decision to do it. With Napoleon, she's actually going to have a son. He's going to be styled King of Rome at birth. He was later Duke of Reichstadt. And he briefly succeeded Napoleon as Napoleon II. But he's going to go on to actually you know, be raised in Austria and dies young. Well, he was 30, but he dies nonetheless. So these are some of the leaders of the French Revolution. As we can see, we're going to look at phases during this time period because, so I'm going to tell you yet again, revolutions are easy to start. They're very hard to control. So we have that early phase moderate phase. And actually, this is kind of the phases that we now use to describe any revolution. They start with moderate aims. It's kind of, you know, you get the upper class, the middle class running it. And the second phase is more radical phase, where those radical elements take over. And that's the reign of terror. So our first moderate phase, you know, very moderate phase is where you have 1789 to 1792, where the king is still a king and they try for a constitutional monarchy. By 1792, more moderate, yet still radical forces took over, and you get that one period of the First Republic, you know? But by 1793, that falls into the reign of terror, and that's gonna last until 1794, when there's a cooling off period. During this cooling off period, France had a lot of different governments, and they tried a lot of different things. And then Napoleon shows up, and then that's the last phase of the revolution, is that Napoleonic era. Um, and so we're going to see lots of things happening during this time, and lots of stories, and very interesting. I mean, the historical debate is, was Napoleon good for Europe, or was he bad for it? It just, I guess it depends on your point of view. In the end, um, whatever, it, it's mute, moot point, because in the end, Everything goes back in 1815 to how it was before Napoleon. And so that's where you get the 1800s and all the civil wars and the further revolutions and the unifications and just mass migrations of people and an explosion of art and literature. And it becomes an incredibly romantic era. And we actually call it the century of the isms because of all the ideologies that rise up. So very exciting time in world history.